Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event, The Legacy of the Former Colored School Number no. 4, presented by historian Eric K. Washington. Tonight's class will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel for free viewing. You may also watch our previous virtual tours and preservation school classes on our YouTube channel. In addition to our virtual programming, we have our Preserving Affordability Symposium on March 22nd, a preservation school class presented by the Public Design Commission on April 13th, and another event with Eric about the red caps of Grand Central Terminal on May 2nd. We will also be announcing our 2023 Six Celebrate Neighborhoods soon. Please check out our website, hdc.org, for more information and to sign up for those events. If you have any questions about programming, you can contact me, Michelle Arbelu, at marbulu at hdc.org. And with that, I will hand it over to Eric. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm Eric K. Washington. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, and thank you, Historic Districts Council, for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the former Colored School Number no. 4 in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood. And many of you uh, may already have heard that the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted recently unanimously uh, to calendar the building for a public hearing. And uh, calendaring is the first step in the designation process, and hopefully the date will be set imminently. Uh, I've prepared a, a slideshow to give you an overview of my introduction to the site, its history and significance, and some of the process towards getting it designated. Uh, last week, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I first became aware of um, the languishing schoolhouse about five or six years ago while researching my book, Boss of the Grips, The Life of James H. Williams and the Red Caps of Grand Central Terminal, uh, a biography whose protagonist had been one of its late 19th century pupils and graduates. And in uh, November, 2018, I appealed to the city's Landmarks Preservation Commission to consider the building for designation. Uh, bolstered by newspaper accounts, um, city resources at the Municipal Archives were especially invaluable to me um, from the 1940 tax photos that proved that the building was the same one uh, as today uh, to Board of Education records that it holds uh, that informed me who worked and even lived in the building and to vital records such as birth, death and marriage certificates that helped me to put the building in context with the surrounding neighborhood. And that surrounding neighborhood includes today's Chelsea, Greenwich Village, and the Flatiron District that many of you know pretty well. Um, so I'm happy to share information that might shed a little bit more light on those areas in bygone days. Okay. For, um, as a New Yorker, I know there are woefully too few extant properties that reflect the complex historical trajectory, milestones, and breadth of our great city's African-American experience. But I also know that un unlikely doorways often reveal essential but forgotten stories. And this is demonstrated by some of the many people and events you're about to meet that have passed through the doors of the former colored school, uh, uh, number four schoolhouse. For, I'm sorry, and I just wanna back up one second there. Um, for 34 years, from 1860 to 1894, the three-story building at 128 West 17th Street embodied New York City's official racial caste education system that spanned most of the 19th century. Successively known as Colored School No. 7, Colored School No. 4, and Grammar School No. 81, the old schoolhouse duly served the numerous working class African-American families that were once concentrated in Chelsea's West Side blocks. In what was then part of the city's dubious Tenderloin precinct, during the uh, Civil War, the post-bellum Reconstruction era, and the ensuing decades of New York's gritty bordered gr Gilded Age. Colored sc School Number no. 4, and I'll be using that even though it had three different names um, for expediency, uh, Colored School Number no. 4 was integral to an inf informal plexus of other African-American schools, churches, enterprises, missions, and societies that gave anchor to Lower Manhattan's growing Black enclaves as they drifted upwards to West Side neighborhoods like Hell's Kitchen and San Juan Hill. Indeed, this late 19th century school graduated the progenitors 
of myriad citizen leaders who effectively made the community of Harlem, even farther uptown, the renowned 20th, uh, 20th century capital of Black America. To my knowledge, uh, the 17th Street building represents Manhattan's only surviving colored schoolhouse and possibly the borough's oldest extant public education facility as well. But how did it come about? Historically, this was one of a series of schoolhouses that evolved from the African free school system that was established in 1787 by the New York Manumission Society to educate black children at the beginning of what became a protracted process of gradually abolishing race-based slavery statewide. The structure is a rare example of the model primary schoolhouse designed in 1843 for the public school society, which adopted it the next year as an efficient plan. When the Board of Education formed in 1853, it absorbed the properties of the public school society. Now, the former schoolhouse on West 17th Street was built in about 1849, and that's according to a re retrospective survey in the Board of Education's 1854 annual report. You see that little white band at the top, it's probably not legible on your screen, uh, but the two little red lines on either end uh, indicate um, the schoolhouse. It's listed at 98 17th Street, uh, which is a whole other story. At, at some, for many years, it was, uh, the address was 98 West 17th, and then around 1868, um, the city reconfigured the lot numbers by adding 30. Um, so it became 128, which it is, uh, to now, uh, is today. Um, so uh, that was according to the, this retrospective survey that the board, uh, this 1854 annual report um, uh, made, which cited that year, 1849, uh, for the $4,400 construction of the three-story schoolhouse at 98 West 17th Street. Uh, the lot's corresponding footprint also appears on an 1852 map by Matthew Drips. And that section, that map section that you see there on the left um, zooms in on uh, 17th Street. And circled in red there is the footprint of the building that is still there today. Just below that, by the way, uh, in circled in blue was the, uh, you can, maybe just make out the words uh, African Union Methodist Church, which also figures into the story, um, which I'll address in a minute. Uh, although most famously known um, as a school for black children, the 17th Street building did not start out as such. Uh, and that 1852 map indicates its use by public primary schools 27 and 28. Five years later, uh, you see the little map section on the right, Municipal records and maps in 1857 show the building's shared use by prim uh, primary school number 25 and number 26. And by 1859, the building housed uh, one school, primary school number 14, which gave way the next year in 1860 to its longest lasting occupancy as a colored school. This 1853 rendering of the 1843 design depicts an identical facade to the building um, at, at present at 128 West 17th Street. And give or take some variations, the dispersed schoolhouses basically followed this prescribed exterior and, and interior plan, uh, which colored school, house, colored school number four also mirrored. Now, keeping in mind that 1843 design uh, here's how the old schoolhouse appeared in 1908, 1940, and today, respectively. So the two black and white photos at the top there um, of the same building. Um, there we get a glimpse of what it looked like with the original brick, brick-colored um, facade before it was um, treated or painted over uh, with a sort of um, a white or yellowish veneer um, sometime in, the, in about the 1930s. Um, the black and white photo at the bottom is a 1940 tax photo. And by that time, the Department of Sanitation had just taken it over. There's a little plaque um, below the second row of windows. It says Department of Sanitation. And then there's one over the door uh, on the ground floor that's nearest to us that says Fire Veterans. And then um, the color photo at the bottom is, is uh, how it looks at present. 
So it was in September 1860 that the Board of Education elevated the former colored primary school number one, which was located uh, nearby in the basement of the African Union Methodist Church. And that was the that little figure that I pointed out a little earlier. By merging it, the prime, that pr colored primary school number one, uh, with a new uh, grammar school at the 17th Street Schoolhouse. And when it opened in September 1860, this would be called Colored School Number no. 7 under Principal Charlotte S. Smith. Um, we haven't found yet an image of, of Principal Smith, but um, she's silhouetted there at the bottom left. In addition to the new uh, Colored School Number no. 7's day school for children was an evening school for adults. And just before Christmas of 1860, a guest uh, attending the close of the first term of that evening school wrote that the schoolhouse was filled to its utmost capacity, there being not less than 500 present to witness members of the night school. So large a number of grown persons, some 60 and 70 years of age, uh, received their certificates of regular attendance. A measure of that reception significance might be weighed by the participation of Reverend Dr. James W.C. Pennington, who you see in the upper left-hand corner. He was a Brooklyn-based minister, orator, writer, educator, and abolitionist of international renown who came to, uh, to say the benedictions for the school. Ultimately, however, the school's driving spirit was its redoubtable principal, Sarah J.S. Tompkins, who you see in the uh, toward the right, um, the larger portrait there. On April 30th, 1863, as the Civil War raged, um, Principal Tompkins' 31-year tenure began when she was appointed to replace Charlotte Smith, the recently deceased principal at Colored School Number no. 7. And Tompkins had to show her medal within her very first few months. On July 14th, 1863, a crowd of unruly whites spilled into West 17th Street during New York's infamous draft riots. And just the day before, such a rabble had attacked the Colored Orphan Asylum up on Fifth Avenue and 43rd Street. Irrespective of the children inside, whom the staff had fortunately ushered through a back door to safety and burnt the orphanage to the ground. A newspaper description suggests that Tompkins now faced a potentially similar scene of terror. The mob congregated in front, while the school was in session. It seems that two colored women whom they had pursued had taken refuge in the school building and they were determined to get at them. The teachers promptly barred all the doors leading into the street and the rioters. After, oh, and the rioters, after a few ineffectual efforts to break in, turned their attention to a little wooden shanty on the opposite side of the street. The draft riots of 1863 amounted to five days of carnage and murder. The school emerged unscathed. However, the incident surely left deep, uh, deep set emotional scars. Months later, newspapers reported a Thanksgiving festival of the colored children of Ward School No. 7 under the charge of Mrs. Tompkins in gratitude for their escape from death during the late riots. By the following spring, the unrest um, in 1864, the unrest on 17th Street had ended. But just a few blocks east of the schoolhouse, the school, the scene, the street was a scene of bustling activity that captivated the pupils. Set up along 17th Street, on the 17th Street side of Union Square, the Metropolitan Sanitary Fair of 1864 was a monumental civic festival to aid the Union Army's sick and wounded. Tompkins notably engaged the school in the city's major war relief effort, albeit off-site farther down at Shiloh Presbyterian Church on Prince Street, which was then under Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, the renowned abolitionist educator and later statesman. Colored School No. 7 gave a musical and, drum and dramatic uh, benefit in aid of the soldiers. No doubt for the newly formed 20th U.S. Colored Infantry in particular, who ceremoniously received their colors in front of the Union League Club on 17th Street across from Union Square. Soon afterward, uh, Ren Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, himself a graduate of New York's African Free School, left for a new ministry in Washington, D.C. Then uh, a president, he left there for a presidency at, uh, of Avery College in Pittsburgh, where his wife died in 1870. Returning to New York, he inevitably reconnected with Tompkins, 
who was ever a community activist throughout her tenure. In March 1871, Tompkins initiated a series of public lectures in the schoolhouse, by now renamed Colored School Number no. 4. The first speaker was Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, whom Sarah Tompkins married four years later, becoming ever after Sarah Garnett. Besides Henry Highland Garnett, other notable visitors associated with the school included, uh, you see at the left, uh, Lieutenant Governor Oscar James Dunn of Louisiana, uh, Louisiana, <laughs> Louisiana. Um, he was uh, elected governor during Re the Reconstruction era. And he visited the school uh, just after having visited President Ulysses S. Grant in 1869. In the center there, um, Henry Ossian Flipper, who was a West Point cadet who would go on to become uh, the first uh, black graduate of West Point. He visited the school in 1875. And um, Sir James Bain, Lord Provost of Glasgow, who visited the school uh, during his visit to the US uh, that centennial year in 1876, uh, the mayor of, of the city was showing him around as mayors are wont to do with visiting dignitaries to all the places that uh, should impress a visitor and colored school number four was, was one of them. And to the right there was J.A. Arnaud, who was a Black Shakespearean actor and journalist. He had his own um, theater troupe, um, who often uh, did benefits uh, to raise money for the school. Um, and the students in turn would, would, would get to see shows that they were performing. Um, he held one of the big benefits on 14th Street at uh, Steinway Hall, which no longer exists. Uh, I think it was 1885, when um, sub subscriptions were being um, solicited to build uh, Grant's tomb. And he did a production, an all black production of Othello um, with himself uh, playing Othello. And um, newspapers also cited the school's engagement during notable events that included uh, the presidential inauguration of Ulysses S. Grant in 1869, uh, a memorial to US Senator Charles Sumner uh, in 1874. Sumner's been spoken of more recently. Uh, he was a US Senator who for his abolitionist sentiments was beaten by another uh, senator on the floor of, of, of Congress uh, unconsciously. Um, a memorial to US President James A. Garfield, um, where, um, who, was the, who was the president who had appointed Henry Highland Garnett to be the minister to Liberia. And um, it was also the onstage participation in Louise A. Smith's The Little Mountain Fairy. She was a Washington DC playwright who had a production of one of her plays here in New York at Chickering Hall, uh, no longer in existence, but that was where um, Oscar Wilde first appeared um, when he first came to, uh, to New York. And there were about 30 students from Colored School Number no. 4 who appeared on stage in, in the production. So by the early 1880s, uh, the state legislature was poised to let the Board of Education absorb its handful of Jim Crow colored schools into the general system. And these schools were admittedly sad relics of the slavery era. And yet the diligence of black educators had bestowed them with a distinct pride of place in the African-American communities that they served. And maybe it's telling that in 1887, Tompkins's pupils were celebrating the anniversary of the 15th Amendment, a law peculiar to Black interests insofar as it guaranteed voting rights, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That almost two decades since its passage in 1870, and they were still celebrating this. At any rate, the proposed closure of these schools galvanized Sarah Garnett and others to a mass protest, again, at Chickering Hall. Uh, reportedly encouraged by a letter from Frederick Douglass, they implored the Board of Ed either to retain black teachers as equals with white teachers or else to leave the colored schools as they were. Ultimately in 1884, a legislative act signed by New York State Governor Grover Cleveland spared just two of the separate race-based schools. One of them was colored school number four, thereafter designated grammar school number 81. But 10 years later, upon determining it to be no longer required for school purposes, the Board of Education resolved in 1894 to sell the building, which it obviously never did. For her part, 
Sarah Garnett remained an activist educator, community leader, and suffragist. In 1895, she co-founded an association to build a community hospital. Later in her native Brooklyn, she and her sister, Susan McKinney Stewart, the state's first uh, black woman to earn a med medical degree, founded the Equal Suffrage League, which in 1908 joined with the National Association of Colored Women to petition the US Congress for women's right, women's right to vote. And at her memorial in 1911, personal testimonials were heard from her active allies, uh, civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois and redoubtable journalist Ida B. Wells Barnett. This was commensurate with the high reputation that Garnett had built at Colored School Number no. 4. By the time the school closed in 1894, Garnett's diligent core of African-American teachers had long made it a singular pillar of the, of the Black community. The school's other remarkable teachers included J. Imogen Howard. She was a, in 1868, uh, she was a Bostonian. Um, J. Imogen Howard joined the teaching staff at Colored School Number no. 4. She was, had been an award-winning essayist as, as, a, a child, as a student and also a musical prodigy. In 1893, New York's governor, Roswell, B., uh, Roswell P. Flower, appointed Howard uh, to represent New York State at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. She was the only Black manager at that World's Fair. In, 18, in 1900, uh, she was the only Black winner of the Evening Telegram newspaper's Great Teachers Competition, who was sent to the Paris Exposition of that year. William Apo, um, he joined the school staff in 1865, and I'm sorry, this no image of him that's yet been found. Uh, he was one of the most influential African-American music educators of the century. He started with legendary black maestro Francis Johnson. There is a little um, picture of him you see toward the left, uh, lower left there, um, with whom he toured uh, uh, from Philadelphia, with whom he toured England in 1837 and purportedly performed before um, Queen Victoria. They were said to have been the first ensemble, uh, American ensemble, black or white, um, to go to, uh, to, to England as an ensemble. And Apo was aligned also in, um, in the 1840s to white abolitionists, uh, Jared Smith and John Brown, and to black suffrage activists in upstate New York near Lake Placid. It was an area called Timbuktu uh, where abolitionist uh, Jared Smith had sold uh, 148 acres of land um, to Apo at a dollar an acre in order to create this um, um, community of, of free Blacks to enable them to vote. For Black men to be able to vote, they had to satisfy a $250 property qualification. So uh, it didn't last very long. And uh, I think that might have had to do with the fact that a lot of them um, were professional urban people. They were, you know, city people. Um, so living in the in, up in the country was not um, kind of part of their nature. But it was a significant community. And also uh, the white abolitionist, John Brown, uh, had property there. So he was a neighbor of Apo's and, and uh, Apo actually performed at his funeral. Um, and Apo's daughter, Helen Apo Cook, taught at a sister school in the system. She um, graduated with um, a degree in 
during World War One, or the Great War, uh, Frazier was uh, president of the Women's Auxiliary of the old 15th National Guard. This was the African-American troop best known as the 369th Harlem Hellfighters uh, Infantry. Uh, she was purportedly the first Black woman to be buried with full military honors. In 1919, that same newspaper, the, the uh, Evening Telegram, uh, had its teachers, great teachers competition again, uh, based on public votes. And Frazier um, was among a group of teachers, uh, the only Black uh, teacher, again, uh, who was sent this time uh, as part of a delegation to the recently hushed European battlefields of the war. And then there were notable graduates who included Walter F. Craig, who was a musical prodigy held as uh, the representative colored violin soloist and musical director of the race. In 1861, his family had moved from Princeton, New Jersey to New York City and enrolled him at the school. It was then called Colored School Number no. 7 at 98 West 17th Street. But by the time Craig graduated, it was Colored School Number no. 4 at 128 West 17th Street. Uh, in 1870, Craig debuted as a violin soloist at Cooper Union, uh, then called the Cooper Institute, and he formed his own Craig's Orchestra in 1872. In 1885, he conducted a German orchestra, which performed at a Black Society Ball at Madison Square Garden. In about 1886, he was the, the first Black conductor admitted to the all-white mus uh, Musical Mutual Protective Union. Uh, Craig also, I and only recently found this out a week or two ago, um, with help from the archivist at Carnegie Hall, was one of the first Black performers uh, at the new Carnegie Hall, which opened in 1891, and Craig was performing there uh, on violin the following year in 1892, uh, and performed there several times. Uh, his famous orchestra was one of the preeminent late 19th century, early 20th century orchestras for Black and white audiences alike. Um, another teacher who was noted, who was a, a contemporary of, of, who graduated with Walter Craig was Richard Robinson. Uh, he went on uh, to pursue the academic route and he became the Board of Ed's assistant supervisor of music to Frank Damrosch. And then um, close to my heart was James H. Williams, uh, the eponymous subject of my biography, Boss of the Grips, the life of James H. Williams and the Red Caps of Grand Central Terminal. Um, as this station's chief red cap uh, attendant for nearly half a century, Williams uh, presided over its essential Harlem-based workforce that produced the city's first black police officer, um, Sam Jesse Battle. Uh, it also produced Columbia's first black architecture grad, uh, grad student, uh, John L. Wilson, and such still familiar names as Paul Robeson, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., um, men of every pursuing every discipline. He was particularly noted for hiring, not exclusively, but particularly hiring uh, young black college men who came from up and down the Eastern seaboard on, on summer breaks, holiday breaks uh, to carry other people's baggage in order to defray their school costs. And um, then many got their diplomas, went back to their respective communities or elsewhere um, as clerics, linguists, journalists, um, doctors, um, actors, sports figures, um, every discipline that you can imagine. So the the former colored school number four, I think opens a singular window on the African-American narrative of New York City's history. And it's heartening that a few years ago, an unrelated uh, Brooklyn public school was renamed in Sarah Garnett's honor. And that just, uh, just last year, um, in Chelsea, Manhattan's PS11 uh, renamed itself the Sarah J. Garnett School. It was a student initiative of um, fourth and fifth graders uh, who su successfully uh, choosing, I think they started with uh, about 30 names and uh, decided upon Sarah Garnett, unbeknown to them that I was, you know, leading this campaign to have this, this building where she had presided for 30 years, um, a landmark. Um, I believe that justice really dictates that we preserve the, this rare heritage site. The last 
surviving colored schoolhouse in Manhattan and honor the impressive lives that filled its rooms. And I think its protection is vital to their stories. I am additionally heartened, of course, that um, you know the results of a couple of weeks ago, uh, the the voting of the Landmarks Commission to calendar it. And I hope that you know many of you who are here will, um, when it when the public hearing opens up, uh, will you know lend your voices to 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 supporting it. So that's the end of the official slides. But I have a bonus track if you would like to see inside. <laughs> Um, Councilman Eric uh, Botcher in December was able to um, get uh, the Department of Sanitation to, to give us a, a, a little tour of the building. Um, remember that reference I made to uh, there being like five or 600 people inside. And I was wondering when I read that um, 1860 account, if that wasn't a bit of hyperbole, because it's one of those buildings where if you blink, you miss it. But once you step inside, this is the ground floor you're looking at. Um, and then you have two, you know, two other floors. You can see that you know that many people could easily fit inside. Um, you may not have noticed, but the in one of the diagrams, the back of the building kind of tapers inward. And there was a, a yard space on the on either side of that. So looking at the end of the hall, you see these two doors, the one, the door on the left leads to this open space that you're looking at, at the left of the screen there. And then that is inside that tapered area. Um, and then the door that's to the right will go through there. And there's the yard space on the other side. And then if you look back into the body of the building, there's there are uh, steps that go up to the second landing. And a lot of this is this brickwork is how the building would have looked uh, uh, originally. I believe that um, those glass doors that you see on that second landing are part of the original um, from the 19th century. This is on the second floor. So we're on the other side of those those windows, which uh, it's hard to tell um, whether they are the original windows, but if they are not, they were repaired uh, replaced, you know, so long ago that they were still emulating the original window design, um, which spoke to the 1843 sketch that you saw with this the 16 over 16 uh, little square panes and uh, the sash windows. And the frames today are still wood uh, window frames, uh, which I don't think you're likely to have seen um, installed within the past few decades. And here we're up on the roof. Um, the group scene, you're looking northward on 17th Street. So if you know that street, like the Housing Works thrift shop is on that street, um, you're looking in that direction. And then uh, to the left of the screen is inside that tapered uh, area of the building with the two open spaces on, on the side of it. So again, I thank you for inviting me. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, there's still an online petition, uh, which is approaching 3,000 names. So if you have a smartphone, you can go to the petition by putting it over the QR code. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have. If you would like, you can put your questions in the chat or feel free to unmute and ask a question. somebody wrote um the adult graduates are especially moving and i i would agree um because it signified that um you know people were fairly desperate and restricted to as to where they could get an education um of whatever guy i but i should say that the evening school was not unique to um colored school number seven uh, as it was when it opened so a lot of the grammar schools did also have without th throughout the board of ed system did also have evening schools for adults but this would have been the only uh the only one for 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 um uh, black citizens Uh, Susan asked, what are your hopes for the eventual use of the building? Oh, that's a great question. So it's um, 
hopes is good because it's premature to make plans um, because it's, you know, the first order of business is getting it uh, landmarked. But I assembled a um, an ad hoc advisory committee of among people I've worked with on different projects over the years, um, uh, historians, architectural historians, uh, social workers, uh, architects, journalists, uh, just to kind of uh, you know, put our thinking caps on for you know what we think it ought to be, and it, there was a general consensus among them and a lot of people in the immediate community um, that it should be just you know hopefully be put to some use that uh, reflects its original use as a school, which is to say that it could have um, an educational component, uh, perhaps a gallery space, perhaps a um, 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 an entertainment space, spa you know, for uh, live performances, um, something all around, and also that is a family area. So it would it would be attractive to both um, young people and 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 adults. Um, so that's you know, if I'm asked, <laughs> uh, that would be one of my hopes for it, yeah, for how it might be used, so that it could serve the community in in um, in it, continuing to, to be put to use to highlight. African American experience in New York, um, which goes back centuries. Thank you. We also had did integration of students in New York City take place before integration of teachers organizations or vice versa? Did did integration of students in New York City? No, so it was segregated for teachers and students alike so that it was all black teachers in the colored school system as well um and then after about 1873 um schools opened up a bit and it was at that point that in in 1870s um as the city is growing and blacks are moving away from the immediate locale of the school and many are taking advantage of 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 um being admitted into the schools that from which they were excluded before because there was a sense that you know it's going to be better for us because it has better facilities and what have you um schools start becoming integrated not for the teachers the teachers were still uh, black teachers were still relegated to the black schools um and that doesn't you know so I would say that students are start, uh, integration is starting earlier for students than it is for the black teachers. Uh, Eric, this is Brad Gauze here. Could you hey, speak? To, hi. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the migration of the black community from Greenwich Village to the Chelsea area, farther north in Tenderloin and? Uh, into Hell's Kitchen, San Juan Hill, and ultimately to uh, Harlem, and how that relates to uh, the Colored School Number Four. Yeah, sure. So you know when it when the school is starts in 1860s, just before the Civil War, um, most blacks are living downtown. Blacks are living all over Manhattan, where anybody else is living, but most are concentrated downtown, as are most whites are concentrated downtown, and the, and the population kind of expands upward um, um, and as that's happening, you know, Blacks like everyone else are moving upwards. And um, while it's down there, it is really a pillar of the neighborhood. And as it progresses to other areas from what we're, around where we call Hell's Kitchen now around the West 50s, West 53rd Street in particular was like a main street of Black mm -hmm. life. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And a little farther mm -hmm. up to what we generally think of as the Lincoln Center area, which was known as uh, San Juan Hill um, early in the 20th century. Um, um, and then even farther up to Harlem, uh, you know, the school graduates, as I, I said earlier, a lot of you know, mm -hmm. people end up moving up there and be leaders, you know, in Harlem in this new community that's way, way uptown. Does, I'm, I'm not sure, does that answer? Yes, yes, that's very, uh, very helpful. Thank you.
We have another one. Have you been in contact with the city department that owns this building? Um, oh, yeah. It sounds like you were since you were in it. Yes. So um, the Department of Sanitation, um, which has had the building since the 1930s, uh, again, uh, Eric uh, Botcher's has been like so proactive and, and wonderful. So he had arranged a meeting with him, um, I think it was last May, last spring. Um, and it was a Zoom meeting and got us together. And there were a, a number of people from community board for the local uh, community board. And, um, it, you know, because we didn't, we didn't know what was going on. As I say, I, I put in the request for evaluation um, a few years before already. It was in November of 2018 and I think we you know we thought in not hearing anything well maybe sanitation is the impediment um maybe they don't want to you know cede the building and it went marvelously you know uh their representative was saying you know actually we're all for it being landmarked um and are willing to you know to relinquish the building and of course nobody it's a zoom call so nobody can pinch each other <laughs> but he was saying all of the right things um and so in the past several months, uh, you know, leading up to this recent um, uh, meeting that was uh, held by the Landmarks uh, Commission, they had been in 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 negotiation with um, sanitation, doing all of the bureau bureaucratic stuff that needs to be done in order to hand over the building. Yeah, it's an ongoing process. So they've actually, um, the sanitation has actually been supportive um, since this came to light in, in in getting the building recognized, so it's not finished yet, but they're not um, they're not standing in the way of it. They're to the contrary, they're they're being supportive of it. That is wonderful to hear. And also, I, I should add that um, they also um, had conducted a survey um, February of last year to get an idea of you know the building's condition they stopped using it about six seven or eight years ago so it was just languishing languishing and that's always a concern when something is just standing because it's not idle is not idle you know mm -hmm. it wants to take over um there are concerns about vermin um you saw a picture that i couldn't photoshop out i could but if i if i were a master of Photoshop, but there was the trash out front. It's not their trash. It's the it's other people's trash that deposited there. Um, so those were, um, you know, those were concerns. So they had an assessment done, and the good, the great thing was that uh, by the assessment, the building was in remarkably stable condition. And while it had condition problems, starting from the roof, it's, it, which is normal, um, it did not pose. Um, a danger, a safety danger to to the public, um, so that could not be used as an excuse for demolishing it. Um, we're more concerned now about demolition by neglect. So we want, you know, to see if you know the powers that be can can um, bring something to bear on making repairs to you know to stop any further compromise of the building from the roof from you know uh, water coming in. I'm sorry, I cut you off, um, Michelle, I think. That is fine. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Eric. This was great. Um, once again, this has been recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube channel, along with all of our other events that I mentioned. Uh, and yes, please stay tuned. Check out our website for our upcoming events and programs. And everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.